thank you, thank Dr. Liu for the nice introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, thank CCAP for inviting us uh, to give a presentation about our research today. So today I'm going to uh, talk about a specific problem, uh, traffic signal control, but then we take into account the uncertainties in this problem, uh, in this application, and we would like to introduce you the optimization approaches that uh, we utilize to solve these uh, giant problems. So uh, you will see how big the formulation is and you know, how complicated it is to solve them. So uh, a focus is to also introduce you uh, some approaches based on uh, decentralization and also decomposition. Uh, you, you commonly used in uh, large scale optimization. Okay, so uh, here is the, the first slide. It's about our team and also acknowledgement. Uh, this research is being funded by um, uh, CCAT through the Department of Transportation uh, UTC program. And um, in this big framework, we study all kinds of problems uh, for uh, real-time control of traffic signals. Okay. And then uh, this particular uh, presentation I'm doing today is associated with this paper. So uh, this paper is uh, having the same title uh, with, and we thank the student author Xin Yufei, uh, Xin Ming Wang, and also Xian Yu, who uh, dedicatedly work on this, uh, this problem and uh, with, uh, with the PIs on this grant, okay? So uh, let me introduce the, uh, the problem. And, and again, you know, like it generate from the, the very um, uh, commonly exist problem in the whole wide world, uh, uh, traffic congestion. So because of uh, the traffic congestion, you will have traffic delays, uh, fuel consumptions, air pollutions, and et cetera. So all these kind of uh, uh, negative impacts coming from the traffic congestion needs to be solved. There are a few uh, different ways uh, people have been trying to sort of like uh, mitigate the congestion. Uh, for example, uh, there are, are uh, congestion pricing that you can see the first sign here that shows you, you know, depending on certain time of the day that you're utilizing certain traffic zones, you'll pay different price. Um, people may think a very natural way, which is uh, expanding the road. But then of course, you know, the literature already studied that uh, it's not that trivial. A lot of times you, uh, adding the lines, not necessarily reducing congestion. So in this talk specifically, we would like to utilize a traffic signal uh, to mitigate congestion, right? If we can actually optimize uh, the traffic signals, and then I would talk about different ways of doing that and what's the setting in our problem. But then our goal here is doing more effectively, flexibly, and also we do not want to add additional economy burdens to the existing uh, uh, infrastructure. So the model I'm going to uh, talk about is going to be based on the following assumptions. So first of all, we would like to ext expanding the literature. The literature of traffic congestion as, and also traffic signal control can be dated back to you know um, decades ago. And it really depends on the, the situation in different countries, how they use, uh, what kind of mechanism they use to control uh, traffic signals. And a lot of times, um, it's natural to think that all the signal, traffic signals are connected with each other, so we should optimize them as a network. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the size of the problem, and then I will introduce you later about our network-based uh, traffic signal optimization model, you will see that it's almost not possible to optimize those uh, in a very um, sort of like a time-efficient fashion, okay? So in the reality, a lot of traffic signal control mechanism is depending on each intersection. So our goal here is to say, can we actually coordinate these intersections and then actually model a network of traffic signals so that uh, we can achieve optimality, okay? But of course, you know, the, 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 the challenge comes from the computational difficulty and I will show you different ways of solving those. The other thing that uh, we're assuming in our current model is uh, some so-called uh, fixed time signal plan. So we use a fixed time signal plan um, for the sake of it's easy to implement and it's pretty commonly well used um, in practice. But of course you can think about, uh, we could do a dynamic way, we could do a real time way. And I will show you how to utilize our sort of like um, offline optimization model later in online fashion. But just for now, we are staying with an offline optimization model, meaning that we would like to find out a plan to, um, to plan the traffic signals throughout the day. Uh, for a certain area, but there's still uncertainty, uh, although it's not dynamic, okay? And then the last part is the uncertainty. We would like to consider when we make these uh, fixed time signal plans, we still would like to take into account 
the the time varying feature of the you know the traffic system uh, specifically you can think about it because we want to kind of like uh, maximize the traffic uh, flow throughput and and also you know other metrics that people utilize to measure the congestion right so then here the things that we don't necessarily know when we make these plans are the traffic demand what the demand is going to look like in a daily base in an hourly base right even we have the historical data but then for for the tomorrow the demand is not necessarily known so the, those are uncertain and also um the what the tra uh, movements of the vehicles in specific way are uh, traffic turning ratios those are the two parameters we would like to consider as random parameter in our model okay so our model is going to be based on the well-known cell transmission model so the idea here is that you want to discretize the whole traffic network. And then in this model, in, if you think about a traffic network, right, the nodes here are the intersections. The arcs here are the road segments that are connecting these intersections. But in our model, it's more specific. We're going to discretize each of the intersections as well as the road segments based on sort of like the discrete time. So you are going to have these cells, which you can consider them as uh, nodes in the network, but the cells have different functions. You can think about some cells represent the origin, some cells represent the destination, some cells are ordinary cells, uh, diverged cells, intersection cells, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a well-established literature. Basically, you, you use the, this uh, CTM to discretize the network that it can you can model the traffic flow within uh, each cell in this way, okay? And also the time intervals of uh, divided time horizon, uh, you will have time steps, uh, how short you will you would like to discretize your network uh, based on the time steps that you consider. Uh, and then sometimes this can be seconds, okay? And then we assume that we know the distribution of the uncertain parameters. So the two uncertain parameters we talked about before, the demand and also the tending ratio, although they are uncertain, we have an underlying distribution that can characterize uh, them during certain time hours okay and then in this formulation we're going to use a finite samples to represent these um the, these uncertainties so so as you can foresee i'm going to show you basically this uh, we so-called two-stage stochastic integer programming model that can be utilized to optimize the traffic signal plans uh for different times of the day and then the uncertainty is going to be in the second stage that uh, it's going to be realized by samples Okay, so this one, this picture gives you an example about uh, a traffic network that has four nodes, right? Only four nodes. But if you want to utilize this CTM model, in fact, you are seeing a much more complex network on the right. And it's necessary because you do want to know how many vehicles that are waiting on, for example, the uh, north um, south direction and intersection one is going to turn left, turn right, and go straight and things like that. So you do have to, you know, make it much more bigger size uh, from the underlying road network to the CTM network. Okay. All right. So I'm going to have a lot of notations just again for the sake of we have so many different types of cells that in this formulation and also the decisions, the parameters. For now, you don't have to remember any of these notation I'm showing you on the slides, okay? I will explain specific uh, notation meanings later once we see the model and then when they are sort of like important. But as you can expect it, I'm going to have a lot of sets to represent uh, the sets of intersections, the set, the number of time steps I have, uh, and then also how many scenarios I have. Uh, and you can imagine some sort of like a Monte Carlo way of sampling the uncertainty. So the K is the total number of scenarios I use to represent the uncertainty. The more scenarios you have, the better it represents a continuous distribution of the uncertain parameter. But of course you need to trade be, uh, trade off between the uh, computational difficulty of that, okay? And then uh, you also, we also have a set of signal phases. And then I'm going to show you examples of our model, how many different phases we consider. But in reality, depending on how many feasible uh, turning that the vehicles can have as a combine, uh, you will have these different signal phases and also the uh, the number of signal cycles and so on and so forth. And then, and then for each of the intersection, I need to determine their green time, right? And also, of course, relatively speaking, uh, there is red time you're deciding as well for these intersections. So you will need some decisions to say, 
uh, how much green time I'm giving to each intersection, and then they will have a minimum and maximum uh, like bounds on them. And again, you know, the parameters, all the ones listed here are the ones I consider as deterministic parameters. So they are all given to you ahead of time, right? Um, and then, and then again, you know, depending on the, the practical situation, you will introduce more pr uh, parameters if, if needed. But for our model, these are the ones we consider. The last one I want to show you is some alpha parameter that we utilize to represent a weight because later on you will see our objective is uh, a multi-objective programs. And in our problem, we consider two different objectives. So we want to kind of like a way between them. And then that's how we combine them into one single objective function. The uncertainties are the ones under the stochastic parameters. And just for simplicity, when you see our model, anything that doesn't have a superscript of K, those are actually um, the, I think the, anything that doesn't have a, super, a, super, a superscript of K, those are deterministic parameters. If they have a K, it means that what's their value in scenario K, right? Because we use uh, samples to represent the uncertainty. So the two uncertain parameters we consider are the tending ratio from cell C to C prime, and depending on whether you can turn from C to C prime uh, in scenario K, and also the, uh, the traffic demand realization of cell C during certain time period. And again, we're discretizing the time steps here. So it's from T to T plus one, okay? So these are the, the parameters. The variables, what we're deciding. So again, when you try to model something using with so-called two-stage stochastic optimization, and two stage means that you have a here now decision you have to make, which are things you have to decide before you see the uncertainty. Okay. And there are also are wait and see decisions, which in the literature we call them recourse decisions. So those decisions, not necessarily you made them, but then they will be realized. The value of those uh, decision variables will be realized after you know how much demand you have and how many vehicles are turning this way and that way. Okay. So in the two stage um, formulation I'm going to have, I have two first stage variables and those are my planning variables. So specifically I'm planning the green time, right? I'm planning the green time at each uh, signal for different time periods. And so there are some direct decision variables you're making and then they could be the beginning and end time of green phase uh, at each intersection. But then because you want to make sure these, um, these green time you give to each of the signal making sense, and you need to have some sort of like a binary variable to linking their relationship and making sure they're valid uh, and logic. And then you have, um, as an outcome, you will have also the length of the green time that you can calculate at each of the intersection of phase J. And also uh, there will be cycle lengths and offset at each of the intersections. So some of these variables, you decide them. Some of the variables are just uh, as a natural outcome of the direct decisions that you made. But then once you made these screen time decisions, and this can be made a day ahead, right? For example, because you do like a fixed time signal plan. Um, then, you know, tomorrow at a specific hour, you see the traffic. And those traffic getting realized in each of the scenario K and correspondingly, depending on how much green time you're giving to the signals, right? You will have realizations. So those are the second stage variables. Those can only be realized after you know the value of the beta and the D because those are your parameter values that are getting realized in each of the scenario. And then because of those values, because of the input uh, first stage variables value, then you will, get, you will have certain constraint to tell you how much vehicles were able to pass through the signal at certain time period, okay? So those, again, you don't decide them. You don't decide the Y, you don't decide the M, but your decision of green tie will, if, uh, will affect their values afterwards. And of course, your uncertainty will affect their values as well, okay? So this is like the general way of modeling a problem, but as you can see, just for a simple, um, demonstration, I, I only consider four different phases. And these four phases are, uh, the sequence of the phases are one to two, two to three, three to four. And then I'm going to have a very giant formulation. So the, formula the, the constraint I'm showing you right now, again, you don't need to know the details. I'm going to uh, explain by Brock, like what these constraints are doing in the formulation. But these constraints are all in a so-called set X. Okay, and what does it mean? This basically say this X doesn't have any superscript, right? 
it's something that you, you, can, you can formulate their relationship upfront. You don't need to know the demand. You don't need to know anything. This set X, later on, you will see that in the formulation. This set S is just the first line. So all the planning variables that you, you have in the first stage, they need to satisfy the constraint in the set S. And after they, you plan these variables value, and then they will be passed to the second stage, and you can utilize their value to say, what is my flow right, of the traffic and things like that using the other constraints. Okay, so I'm going to show you basically how we model the X set. So as you can imagine, right, I can assign arbitrary values to each of the signal if I want uh, in terms of how much green, green time I want to give to them. But you do want to follow some sort of like definition of the variable. So there are two binary variables that I have, which is Z1 and Z2. And again, you don't necessarily need to know their meanings, but what it says here is that um, this set of constraint, which is mixed integer, it has binary variables, it has continuous variables, will tell me the time that I assign. Uh, so the time t I'm looking at right now, where it is located, okay? So I have certain b value and e value. If you go back here, b and e are beginning and end time of the green phase of j and j prime at intersection i. And if I, I'm looking at a certain time period t in my network, I would like to know is the t in between these beginning and end time or not, right? So basically this constraint tells you that if your t is within this beginning and end time, which means that you're currently at a green time right now because you have the beginning b and ending e, and then your z will be equal to one, z1 will be equal to one, z2 will be equal to one, okay? And of course, each of the T, it can be within the green phase you have or not. And then these constraints will tell you the right relationship between the B and E as well as the Z variables, okay? So these are the, um, these are the first set of mixed integer constraints you have. And as you can see, the difficulty will come from these constraints because they have binary variables, continuous variable, and the big M, okay? For these uh, binary variables, we need to have some big M coefficient, which will cause a lot of computational issue later but you have to have it. And then also I would like to compute the start and end time of green phase given green time of set and cycle lengths. And these can be realized by these set of constraints. And again, you know, your green time uh, that you, you give to each of the intersection cannot be more than um, the maximum green time you can give. So these maximum and minimum green time will be just like some common sense, right? So uh, if I'm giving a green time, it will be, um, reasonable to say two minutes, uh, sorry, two seconds, and then you are, you're done, right? So, so you will have some uh, maximum minimum up front, and then you will need to make sure that uh, bound is being satisfied. Now, if you imagine, once you know the green time at each intersection, and you know what's the traffic demand, and also how they're going to turn in each of the scenario, then you would like to know how much how many vehicles leaving each of the cell or within the cell at certain time period and so on and so forth. So the relationship is pretty simple. Uh, if you think about the vehicles that can leave a cell, like the flow, um, it will be the minimum between several terms. So how many cells, I, how many vehicles I have in that cell, right? And also I may have certain capacity, flow capacity, because if you think about um, certain roads with and then the congestion capacity, you could have some number that being given to you that you cannot move too fast because there are too many vehicles right now. And then there will be some, um, uh, the vehicle that can enter the cell. So you just take the minimum of on the three uh, that you will be able to know the vehicles that can leave a cell. And also if you try to uh, measure, right, within each time, say I'm looking at time T plus one right now, how many vehicles are currently in cell C and again, that cell can be all kinds of things, right? It can be the cell that is currently at this intersection. It can be the cell that is turning. So you go, you go back to the CPM uh, model to see which cell you're talking about. But then, you know, it will be from the previous times N plus how many new ones enter minus how many out. So these are flow balance constraints in general, but then of course it's not that simple because it really depends on whether you have boundary cell or intermediate cells and things like that. But just for this, you already see you need a minimum measure and that's nonlinear. 
So you can take uh, the model to a linear way. And fortunately, we're doing minimization. So the way to minimize this uh, is pretty simple. You can just say the Y variable is less than equal to N, less than equal to the second term, and less than equal to the third term, because that's a minimum of the three, all right? So now you can imagine I'm going to have just a snapshot of the model. Um, as I said, right, in the objective function, I do care about throughput. I also care about uh, flow. So then I can weight both of them using an alpha parameter. But in reality, let's say someone only care about throughput. They can just let alpha equal to zero and then focus on the throughput. So in this model, we take the balance of the two. But then because the objective function, either the throughput or the flow are second stage, right? After you know the vehicle's demand and the vehicle's uh, turning ratio, then you will know how much vehicle actually are in these cells and pass through and stuff like that. So the whole objective function is measuring the expected value of that, in fact. Uh, I cannot have a single term because everything depending on the K, but I do know the probability of scenario K and I take an expectation. I would want to maximize the throughput. That's why if it's a minimization problem, you need to have a minus in the front. And that's my objective function. In reality, if there are other costs associated with your planning decision, like how much green time you give to each of the signal, you can add those to your objective as well, okay? Um, in terms of a constraint, I have some first stage constraints saying what's the relationship between these green time. And then these variables, right, Z1, Z2, are going to be passed to my second stage to say, how can I calculate my vehicle flow once I know my green time, okay? So in the second stage, you will have the number of vehicles right, being bounded. As I said, these Y variables are minimum among three things. So you have to say Y less than equal to the first term, Y less than equal to the second, and so on and so forth. Um, there's also um, yeah, other kind of Y variables, right? Relationship depending on the turning, whether this cell is a turning cell. And also you have the number of vehicles leaving a cell is bounded by the number of vehicles that can enter. And then last part is the flow cons uh, conservation uh, constraint. So you have this uh, flow balance constraint you need to satisfy, and that will tell you relationship between N and Y, okay, in that way. So you can see that the second stage constraint is divided into two sets, right? One is the, the Y and your first stage variables relationship. The other is the Y and your N variables relationship, but both of them will reflect, get reflected in your objective. And then Y both. And then you have some um, initial starting period uh, constraint status of your system, okay? So this model, and then you can see that the constraint, the number of constraints really depends on the number of scenarios you have. So you can see this, except the blue one, every single block, that down here is a big block, that one block is for 1K and so on and so forth. So intuitively, two-stage stochastic optimization, normally people would do this uh, parallelization, right? They will solve each of the scenario, try to do something and generate a cutting plan or something to the first stage problem. And this is exactly what we're going to do, but still that's not enough, okay? And you will see um, the computational time comparison later. So we will need to, to, in fact, we need to do something smarter and we need to use this distributed algorithm to do it. So the generic idea here is if I'm talking about decomposition, say for every scenario, right? I'm uh, looking at a one second stage problem. Um, it's one layer of decomposition. But if you think about your problem, it's a network problem. And then every intersection is connected with each other somehow using these flow balance constraints, right? But still they can be decomposed. So I know it, originally I say, we're going to discuss this network problem uh, that's not optimized just for every intersection. But the reality is everyone is doing the intersection based optimization. And in fact, we can use that as a sub problem in our formulation. So can we utilize the spatial and temporal decomposition that we can observe from our problem? So the spatial one is intersection, right? We can, we can focus one intersection at a time and then talk about their relationship later by adding some penalties and stuff like that. The temporal one is time, okay? So I have this connection between T and T plus one, but then can we just focus on each T separately? 
And so you, it turns out to be that uh, for the decomposition part, yes, you can do this, but you need some sort of like a Lagrangian type of way to do it because you ignore their relationship and you need to add some penalty back, okay? And then the idea here is that we want to utilize some Bender's decomposition, which will utilize the dual information to generate cutting plans. But then when we do that, we would like to combine with ADMM, okay? Which also utilize the dual information to do distributed optimization. So if you think about my problem, I'm going to solve some, something we call relaxed masses problem or relaxed first stage problem. We do not think about uncertainty, demand, or turning ratio in the second stage. Let's just design the green time and then making sure they actually make sense, are feasible, right? Feasible green time, that's it. And I'm going to pass my green time into my second stage. And then each intersection will know their own green time, right? And again, I'm not going to look at the whole formulation in the second stage, but then try to make some distributed way of solving the second stage. So each second stage will have uh, one intersection being solved uh, in parallel. But then I will utilize their information to update the dual. And then I will generate cutting plans because it's a bandless way. In the second stage, if you go back, the nice thing about the second stage, although it looks giant and, and very tedious, they're all continuous. All my Y variable and N variable are continuous, right? So my binary variable is only on this first stage, which is nice because if you pass the variable, the first stage variables value to the second stage. Second stage is a linear programming, okay? Linear programming has strong duality. And because you have strong duality, you will have convergence eventually, all right? So this is the whole idea, the generic idea. We will develop these vendors cuts based on the ADM uh, solution approach in the second stage. And then, so let me be more specific. In the first stage, the signal constraints are separate for each of the intersections. So if you think about first stage, in fact, we can do ADM as well, because this first stage uh, signal plan is being connected as a network. You could just look at every intersection, but uh, you, will, you will have some penalty, and I will show you later when you ignore their relationships. And then you can also make the problem uh, faster if you pre-decide the first stage cycle lens. Okay, so these are can be done in a separate way using some uh, data mining uh, approach to think about what's the best cycle lens you want to use. So the cycle lens is no longer my variable, but the fixed parameter. And once you have that, all my second stage from each of the period K, right? I'm going to aggregate them and call them a variable theta. Because right now I have no idea what theta is. I have to estimate. I have to estimate the flow, the throughput in the second stage resulted from my first stage decision. So in your first stage, all you need to do is solve the formulation corresponding to each of the intersections separately. And then, you know, try to later on incorporate the cutting plans you, you get from the second stage. But at the first step, of course, these cutting plans are empty set. You don't have any cuts yet. So you can just like up, uh, estimate, okay? And if you look at this individual cell-based uh, second stage problem, if you have the first stage variable, you can pass them to the second stage. All you need to do is differentiate between Boundary cells are non-boundary cells. So for boundary cells, you have some constraint, non-boundary cell, you have other constraints, and you just, again, separate them, okay? And then the ADM for the second stage looks like the following. Uh, I'm going to relax the constraint for the boundary cells as penalty terms, and I'm going to add them as a Lagrangian function. So I'm going to look at the Lagrangian function in the second stage, and that Lagrangian function, if you see the detail here, it has two terms, which is in your original objective, right? Original second stage objective, the N and the Y. That's all you care. But because you ignore the boundary cell constraint, you have to add them multiplied by the dual variable as penalty terms. So these are all penalty terms you add following the, uh, the ADM away, okay? And you just do the minimization problem of this Lagrangian function over linear uh, constraints you have. And you update the dual variables by gradient descent and or, or other ways, it's up to you how you update the dual. And then you can generate a cutting plan based on each of the intersections. So the intersection wise cutting plan is uh, for I and, and scenario K, every theta is going to be greater or equal to uh, this term on the right hand side. So you can show that if this is your Lagrangian function, eventually this is going to be a valid cut. 
Okay, so in our paper, the theoretical result is whether this will converge and how many cuts I need eventually and that kind of thing. So first of all, the cut I just show you is a valid cut. It's showing the theorem one in our paper. And by the way, our paper um, is available online so you can search. And then um, our algorithm will converge to the optimal solutions and optimal objective value. And then the reasoning is again, what I just said in a very loose way, because your second stage don't have an integer variable. So it's in itself has strong duality, okay? And then um, following the uh, approaches, you can do this. So if you look at this, the ADM based spatially decomp decentralized vendors algorithm, it's nothing else but just you integrate the ADM approach, which is based on each of the intersection. So R is the intersection, the set of intersections. And then you do that for every scenario when you have that ADM prop based problem. And then that problem you utilize, you apply vendors to it, okay, to get a vendors cut. Okay. So I'm going to show you some uh, numerical results um, to, to see how effective that uh, this approach is. I didn't show, I only show you the spatial term, the decomposition distributed algorithm for a second stage, but in fact, you can do that to, to first stage as well. And then uh, you can also do another uh, temporal decomposition if you want. So these details are all in the paper, okay? But then um, if you think about the problem, right? We're going to look at the whole time horizon uh, as half an hour. So, so our model is going to be applied to do a fixed timing plan every half an hour for you know, tomorrow, for example. And then uh, the small example I'm showing you is only 10 scenarios, but you can increase the number of scenarios to make it more um, uh, representing the stochastic better. Uh, I have some other parameters that are from, in general, from the literature about how do you set up this kind of um, models. And the minimum green time is considered as six seconds and the maximum is uh, 150 seconds. And then just to give you an idea about the problem size, the model I just show you, even for only 10 number of scenarios, and I'm going to do this to four by four uh, network, green network. And later you will see that I also test up to 10 by 10 green network. So this whole 100 intersections is going to be considered connected and I'm going to optimize their um, uh, green time to uh, only four by four, you will have 10,000 integer variables, 500,000 continuous variable and 1 million constraint. If you want to model this problem, let's give it to Groby and let it solve, okay? But it grows very fast. So after two hours, as you expected, Groby is not able to find an even feasible solution to this problem. Uh, but again, you don't necessarily need to use this uh, CTM, right? There are certain other ways of doing up, you know, control of the signals. But I'm just saying, if you use this optimization model, it's going to be very tedious. Um, and then if you just say, let's look at the vendors. We do not think about ADMM. We do not do distributed. We just say first stage, optimize the green time, give it to second stage, left second stage, figure out what's the Y and N and generate vendors cut to the first stage. This is what we're going to show as vendors. And if I say vendors slash ADMM, th that's going to be a full version, okay? I'm going to generate vendors using ADMM in the first stage, in the second stage, based on each intersection. So you can see that everything that uh, it's called MP, SP, they are master problem and sub problem. So they are first stage problem and second stage problem. And then I'm doing minimization, maximization, or average time reporting because we have different types of instances. But in general, vendor slash ADMM will beat vendors very well. Okay, so some of these instances, even you use vendors, it's going to take hours. But using uh, vendor slash ADMM is going to still be doable within hour. But again, this is offline optimization. So you can solve this model a day ahead and then implement it the next day for 10 by 10, but it's really not necessary. A lot of times, in fact, if you just look at a small grid, it's enough to guarantee some uh, good quality of the solution. If you want to do stochastic optimization in general for any kind of application, you know, people will ask you for in-sample test and out-of-sample test, right? So what, are they, what do they mean? In-sample means, you know, anything that you solve. So I solve a stochastic optimization model, right? I get some objective value as a result. Uh, and based on the 10 scenarios I have, those are in sample. What you can do is I don't want to solve a 10 scenario. I want to solve only deterministic formulation, but then plugging the mean value of my demand and, um, and also the turning ratio, right? I can do that. 
So, so I'm going to show you some in-sample results, but in terms of our sample is once you have those solutions, you can plug in them into new scenarios. So those scenarios, in fact, will, will be generated using uh, same distribution, different distribution, that's okay. If it's same distribution, you're just saying, you know, this, the 10 scenarios I have, the results I get from those, is it still robust, right? If I generate another 10 scenarios. If it's a different, different, different distribution, you know, it can be, you, you thought it's a normal distribution, but it's actually something else, right? Uniform distribution. So these ways you can see the robustness of your solution. So I'm going to show you that, in fact, if you see the stochastic problem, I'm going to measure the gap between my in-sample and out-of-sample value, just to see how different, um, if you use a different set of uh, scenarios, how different the results will be. And in general, a stochastic model will have much smaller gap um, compared between the in-sample and out-sample, which means that it will have better performance under uncertainty. If you zoom in this out-of-sample evaluation, there are certain things you care, right? You care about traffic delay, uh, travel delay by each of the car. And then you also care about total number of vehicles actually passing through the whole network. So before we have this uh, throughput in each cell, but now let's aggregate them together and see how many vehicles were able to pass through the whole network. And again, you know, if you use uh, the, the stochastic approach, so this is SP stochastic, deter is deterministic. And you can see that stochastic and deterministic gap is reported here on the very right uh, column. Again, stochastic is going to outperform the deterministic in most of the cases in terms of the vehicle delay and the throughput. If you plot the, uh, the vehicle delay and throughput in the inter out of sample by uh, distribution, then it's more clear. Anything that is green, uh, sorry, uh, blue is a stochastic. Anything yellow is deterministic. So in terms of the traffic delay, the deterministic shift towards the right, which is bigger. In terms of the throughput, the deterministic shift to the left, which is smaller, right? So in general, again, you know, stochastic will outperform the deterministic. So that means uh, it is important to consider the uncertainty, right? The deterministic, I still plugging a number, but that number is just a mean value. And you can solve a, Fairly not that quick, but still you pay the price that the performance is worse. Okay. And I just show you the, you know, kind of like random network, right? Green network. What about it's a real network? We did uh, get data from Ann Arbor, and this is Ann Arbor downtown. And you can see that it has many intersections. Some of the road, in fact, are one way. So we incorporate that as well when we construct our uh, cell transmission network. Um, so then the size of the network looks like the following, okay? And then we have uh, other parameters we need to get from the, the traffic data because some of the, the intersection doesn't have signal, so you can't really control them. They're just like stop signs, okay? Um, and then we measure peak hour and off peak hour, okay? And then we use uh, different types of models, different approach to solve the problem. So again, you know, if you look at the computational time results, right, deterministic versus stochastic, of course, stochastic is going to take longer, um, but then still within like set, uh, 10 minutes that you can solve the problem. So it's not that bad. As far as it's an offline problem, it's, it's okay. But if you think about implementing the problem in an online fashion, in fact, 10 minutes is still doable. So what it means is that you are not planning for tomorrow, but then planning for the next hour, for example. But you collect data from the past hour. You learn the demand. You see how many vehicles are actually passing through my intersection. And you re-optimize your problem again and trying to decide on fly, okay? And then it means that if, if this, this is the computational time I have for that another downtown area, I can do this in an online fashion, okay? And again, I'm going to evaluate the results and I'm going to introduce one more approach, which we call baseline approach. This baseline approach doesn't use optimization at all, okay? If you think about it, I'm, I'm just going to assign the green time of each phase proportional to the demand I collected on that uh, area. So it's kind of a very heuristic, right? So you just like uh, collect the demand. If the demand is high, you give them more green time. If the demand is low, you give them less green time. If you do that way, in fact, your performance will be even worse than the deterministic optimization model. So these gaps will show you the delays, the throughput, 
And then again, the winner is always the stochastic model, which take longer time than deterministic uh, model immediately, but then um, they can perform uh, better. And then of course the benefit doesn't get that uh, much if you look at the off peak hour because there are not much vehicles there. Okay, and these are just some pictures showing you, um, if I look at my results, I visualize their congestion. So any of the um, uh, black line here will show you the congestion. Okay, so where are the vehicles? If I look at peak hours and the best scenario, my deterministic model will still have some congestion somewhere. Uh, my stochastic model has fewer congestions, right? Um, the fewer black lines. If I look at um, worst case scenario, both of them has a lot of black lines, but if you aggregate them together, the stochastic is still better. And then off peak hours, you see that uh, best scenario, almost no congestion either approach. And then the under the worst case scenario off peak, uh, there's some congestions here for that deterministic approach, uh, and then a little bit congestions here and here by the stochastic approach. So the conclusion is the following. Um, what approach we use? We use, um, we try to solve, first of all, we try to solve a fixed time traffic signal control problem on general grid. So we do want to look at, and then in fact, you don't have to, you know, kind of restrict yourself to grid. It can be network, any kind of network. As far as you want to connect all the intersections, you can try to see whether you get any benefit out of it. You can, you can model, use our model. And then the way we also try to um, innovate the model is by thinking about uncertainties, right? A lot of time we do these planning, you don't necessarily know the traffic demand and the turning ratio. So we take into account both into uncertain, uh, into the model. And then the approach we use is two-state stochastic integer programming because uh, they're integer variables. Um, the problem is going to be gigantic. So we need to use uh, decomposition distributed algorithms uh, and then those are based on Benders and ADMM. Uh, and then we conduct numerical studies using gen randomly generated grid network up to 10 by 10 um, intersections and also um, the real world network uh, from Ann Arbor. And then we test in sample, out of sample to demonstrate you the benefit. One is to what's the benefit of considering uncertainty? And also two is uh, what's the benefit of utilizing decentralized approaches? And we hope that uh, this, even it's only for traffic signal control, this approach is general. You can sort of like apply to any kind of problem that has this uh, two layer structures, which is you need to plan the resource at the first stage before you see the uncertainty. And then you need to sort of like do something afterwards after you realize the uncertainty. And you can always use this uh, combination of uh, decomposition and distributed approach. Uh, so with that, I will stop and uh, take any questions you have. And thank you again for attending this lecture. Good questions, thank you for your presentation. Um, a quick question mm -hmm. about modeling. Um, it's, you showed that uh, um, the self-transmission model has a, um, it's, it's a minimum of three terms, right? Mm -hmm. And the um, confidence. Okay. So, so you did, did you rewrite that uh, minimum? Uh, yeah, if you if you look at here, the y is a minimum of three terms, n for the q and w times this. Okay. Um, these are all going to be interpreted here as a right hand side. So you have the y less than equal to n, y less than equal to q, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I mean, so so. In terms of rewriting the minimum, it's tricky. Um, right now, you see that I, 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 I say this is a minimum because, and so this is less than equal to all the three terms here. Uh, but then, you know, it depends on your objective function whether you will push the y value down or up. Right in this objective, we actually want to maximize y. So then, because it's a minimize minus y, right? So you want to have more flow. And that's why if you write the y as less than equal to the three term, it will push the y up to one of the term here rather than push it down to zero. So, so this is uh, easier. But then if you do not have this feature of maximizing the y, and then you say y is less than equal to the three term here, and your objective is actually trying to minimize y, this trick will not work. So in order to make this trick work to let y to be one of the minimum, 
then you need to introduce additional binary variables and big M constraints. So this trick makes our second stage doesn't have any binary variables, but linear. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. One, um, mm -hmm. one other question. Um, in, in the practice uh, for fixed time signals, mm -hmm. um, cycle length, yeah. mean time, green speed, and mm -hmm. the at the, uh, the offset. But the, the parameters here, um, how do you translate these parameters into the regular mm. these parameters that can be implemented in the field? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you see that in terms of modeling, I try to incorporate all of the uh, practical uh, variables. So, so this L and O, they are all variables. I can decide all of them, but then their relationship, right, needs to satisfy these constraints. You know, how the offset, offset has to be less than equal to the lens, for example, and things like that, okay? Uh, but then when we do the computation, in fact, we do fix the L as the, the cycle length. So somebody gave me what's the best cycle length you think. And then the way I fix that, because otherwise it really gets big and it cannot solve like a first stage wise. Yeah. I do see some of the common uh, questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the common uh, questions is um, any comments you have on extending this work to vehicle activity? I'm sorry, what vehicle? Uh, how you extend the mm -hmm. time signal to right. activity? Okay, yeah, so, so one of the things that I mentioned is um, to use exactly the same approach, but not necessarily so complex. You can relax some of the constraints, you know, things like that in a real-time fashion. As far as your real-time is not like, you know, like seconds, right? Because it really depends on the, the, the you know, how would you like to do a real-time and dynamic way? Um, if you think about this approach, this basically tells, says that you have to collect some data about demand and vehicle turning. And once you have them, you can have samples. And once you have the samples, you can optimize your traffic plan according to those samples. But those things can be done a day ahead, which then, you know, you do the fixed time. Um, but then you can also be done within, you know, um, minutes. As far as you have like sensors and monitors distributed in the whole network, and as vehicles are passing, you can collect the data in terms of how many vehicles are passing in the past 10 minutes. And that can give you a better estimation, in fact, right, for the next 10 minutes. Maybe there is an event going in or something like that you didn't know from the past historical data. Uh, so yes, as far as uh, we see that this approach can be done in a real-time fashion by looking at, um, if you see this size of the network, right, it's smaller than 10 by 10. So 10 by 10, it looks to me that almost no hope because 10 by 10 will cost you almost like hours, one hour to solve. So this probably needs to be done in a future research. But for the Ann Arbor network, downtown network, the computational time is um, about less than 10 minutes. So you, you, you can do it on the fly, basically, if you use this approach, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So here we do try to solve to optimality. And then as you pointing out, a lot of these large scale optimization problems, they converge very slow at the end. So they already kind of get you pretty good results, two minutes, and then the last eight minutes it's kind of trying to converge. So that's a very good point that, you know, you don't necessarily need to solve it to optimality. But I do want to pointing out that even you do that, with uh, just solve the model without using any decomposition, anything, two hours later, there's even no feasible solution by the solver. And then that's expected because the constraints are just too many. And then the variables are also, you know, a lot. So yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of room to grow in terms of let's find some new way of optimizing. Even you don't want to optimize it, these new ways will be useful for finding feasible solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So in your problem, you're trying to minimize or maximize the uh, uh, throughput with the flow. Right. Um, and the one of your metrics later was average uh, travel delay. Mm. Uh, just wondering, do you think there's any differences if you form the problem in a different way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Optimize. You, you minimize the view, like, Probably right. right, yeah, that's a, that's also a very good question. 
Um, so, so the reason we do this n and the y in the objective is just for the convenience you can track the variable's value. But in the, the, and then we can report to you what is n value, what is y value. Like we can report to you the throughput and the, the traffic flow. But it, the reason we report the traffic delay per vehicle um, and also the throughput is just for the sake of these are sort of like things that people feel more related to. And then, yeah. But then in, to be honest, I don't really know how to capture the traffic delay using the a variable. Like I need to, so these traffic delay is really by simulation. Like you capture that uh, when you do the outer sample test. Uh, but then, yeah, maybe if I can incorporate another variable and use n and the y value to interpret the traffic delay and then add them specifically to objective function, then that's probably something we can do. On the other hand, though, the reason we also didn't incorporate the traffic delay is you see that the traffic delay is measured by per car. So it's more like a user's experience. Um, when we model the problem, it's more from an operator's point of view, look at the whole network and then aggregate all the information we have, like through all these cells and what's the flow. So yeah, it's also debatable in some sense, sort of like, you know, user inspired modeling, how we do it, you know, um, because you are looking at different people's view in some sense, like different stakeholders viewing this model. If you're incorporating both delay and the traffic throughput. Yeah, thank yeah, thank you. One more question is asking you where the paper, what's the title from the paper so that we can find the paper? Oh, yeah. So I, yeah, I think we put on the optimization line. I can, I can search. It's on my website. So the title of the paper is exactly the same as the title of the talk. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So this is the paper's title, which is the okay. talk's title. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I, it may be that I took it offline just temporary because it's under revision right now and we want to make sure after it's finishing the revision within one or two months that I will re-upload it, but thank you. Thank you.